India is the world's new economic power. Its economy has been booming for decades. And today, the country is attracting investment from a growing number of multinational corporations. Just a few decades ago, India barely registered among the world's largest economies. Today, it has the world's fifth largest GDP, and the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi says it expects India to have the world's third largest economy by 2027 just four years from now. Yet much of the country's economic strength comes simply from the sheer size of its population. With 1.4 billion people, it's the second most populous country in the world. And in 2023, it's expected to overtake China to be number one. But here's the thing about India. It's nowhere near as wealthy as China, and certainly nowhere near as wealthy as the West. Its per capita GDP is just one-sixth that of China. The average income earned in India is just 1800 US dollars per year, compared to 15500 US dollars per year in China. India may be on its way up, but it has a long way to go, and there's plenty of reason to think it may never catch up. The country is dealing with structural problems that could hold it back for decades to come. Compared to China or other rapidly growing Asian countries, India has a very low employment rate. Its workforce is undereducated and underutilized, and the country is struggling with one of the worst income inequality problems in the world. In other words, India is simply not the next China. In this video, we're going to outline the problems holding back India's economy. But before we go any further, make sure to subscribe to our channel for the latest economic analysis on trends that are reshaping our world and if you like this video, make sure to hit the like button to help us spread the word. One thing to understand about India is that its status as a relatively poor country is a recent phenomenon. For much of the history of human civilization, India was one of the richest places in the world and a major economic power. It's only in the past few centuries since the era of British colonialism that India was reduced to being a bit player on the global stage. From around 1000 BC to the beginning of British rule in the 1750s, India had one of the world's largest economies. In the 17th century, during the Mughal Empire period, India's economy was the largest in the world, accounting for about a quarter of global GDP. Historians refer to this era of India as being proto-industrial. It had advanced agriculture and its production of artisan goods had developed to a point where it was able to export large amounts of finished products. India was a world leader in textiles and shipbuilding, but with the arrival of the British East India Company and the eventual conquest of India by Britain, this began to change. Throughout the 19th century, India went through a long period of deindustrialization. Previously, the country had used its exports to build up large reserves of gold and other precious metals. But the British East India Company had a different business model. It used revenues it raised locally in India to buy goods to sell abroad. The flow of goods out of India continued, but the flow of money into India stopped. At the same time, Britain was industrializing, and as machines took over from human labor, the cost of production in Britain plummeted. Indian exporters lost their competitive advantage. They couldn't produce goods at the same low prices as Britain. Indian manufacturing collapsed. At the same time, British manufacturers wanted new markets for their goods and pressured the British East India Company into selling their goods in India. So India went from being an exporter of finished goods and importer of precious metals to being an exporter of raw materials and importer of finished goods. The country went into a long period of deindustrialization. In 1700, before British rule began, it's estimated that India's economy accounted for 24.4% of world GDP. By 1950, shortly after India regained its independence, it amounted to just 4.2% of world GDP. Once India gained its independence in 1947, things began to turn around but slowly. India's government was fairly anti-Western at the time, and though it maintained political neutrality, it looked to the Soviet Union for inspiration. The government of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru implemented a five-year plan 
modeled after the five-year plans that the Stalinist regime in the USSR used to modernize Russia's backward economy. Indian five-year plans weren't quite as intense and oppressive as the Stalinist version. They didn't use gulag prison labor to build infrastructure, for instance, but they were a top-down centralized approach to building an economy. Despite what many people would expect, the five-year plan and a whole series of similar five-year plans that came after it succeeded to an extent. The country completed large infrastructure projects like dams and roads, opened scientific and technical institutions, and developed something approaching a modern military. But India remained mired in poverty. For one thing, its population was growing extremely rapidly and the five-year plans couldn't keep up. Also, India's military spending was enormous, equivalent to a quarter of its GDP. This was due primarily to its ongoing conflict with Pakistan. Its economy didn't grow nearly as quickly as some other Asian countries. Compared to South Korea or Thailand or Iran, India was a laggard. For decades during this period, the country ran a large trade deficit with the world and large budget deficits at home. Since very few foreign investors wanted to buy Indian debt, the central bank had to print money, leading to persistent inflation. By the early 1990s, the trade and budget deficits had become unsustainable, and India was forced to take a bailout from the International Monetary Fund, which came with conditions. The country would have to give up its planned centralized economy and move towards market reforms. Those market reforms were painful at first, but as they moved forward, India's economy began to transform for the better. Over the space of two decades, starting in the mid-1990s, India's per capita GDP grew by 142%. The country urbanized rapidly and became a major global player in the steel industry. By the mid-2000s, India's Arcolor Metal was the world's largest steelmaker. Since then, the country has become a major player in the auto industry, textiles, information technology, and banking and insurance. But that economic boom has been very uneven. India has developed into an economy of oligopolies. A small number of very large corporations dominate almost every single sector of the economy. These businesses are protected by their links to the government, making it very difficult for new startup businesses to enter virtually any industry. This has led to extreme income inequality. A recent Oxfam report found that 1% of India's population controls more than 40% of its wealth, while the bottom half of the population has just 3% of the country's wealth. But when it comes to taxes, the situation is the exact reverse. The bottom half of the population pays 64% of the money collected from India's goods and services tax, while the top 10% of the wealth pyramid pay just 4%. This burdening of the poor through taxes doesn't just hold people back, it holds the government back too. With such a small tax base, India hasn't been able to keep up with the development of modern infrastructure. Here's one clear example of the problem. Transportation infrastructure is so poor that 40% of the country's fruit rots before it reaches the market. These kinds of inefficiencies that drain the country's economic potential can be seen everywhere. But there is one problem holding India back above all others, and that problem can be summed up in a single word, labor. Although India's unemployment rate sits at around 7 or 8%, its youth unemployment rate is around 40%. This makes a huge difference in India because it has a very young population. Half the people in India are below the age of 25. What this means is that, overall, a very small share of the population is actually economically active. The country's labor force participation rate is just 40%, and that's actually down from around 46% prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. By comparison, the participation rate in the United States is above 62%. Faced with chronically poor job prospects, many young Indians choose to stay on the family farms that have been the default way of living in India for centuries. This is subsistence farming. They produce just enough to eat and to buy basic goods like clothing and farm equipment. It adds very little to India's economy, 
About 51% of the population is involved in farming, but the sector accounts for only 17% of the country's GDP. Women are also far behind in India compared to most other Asian countries. According to World Bank data, only 19% of women in India have a job, and that's down over the past decade from 26%. This is far below the participation rate for women in China at 65% and the 75% seen in Vietnam. If women were in the labor force at the same rate as men, India would have 235 million more workers than it does today. To give you an idea of how much that is, it's 50% larger than the entire U.S. labor force. India simply isn't building its human capital nearly as well as it should be. Part of that comes down to its education system. The country spends less on education than almost any other Asian country, about 3.1% of GDP compared to 4.8% globally and 5.7% in East Asia. Countries like China, Korea, and even Iran spend far more educating their workforce than India does. And the quality of that education is low. Surveys show that many employers consider the country's job training programs and university degrees to be worthless. They say about half the people they hire out of school don't actually have the qualifications their diploma says they do. For India to keep growing its wealth, it will have to significantly overhaul its education system, and that can't just be done overnight. The government of Narendra Modi is taking steps to address this problem, but those steps may not be large enough or the right ones to address the problem. The central government is planning to hire 1 million new employees in order to increase the employment rate. But that plan hardly helps in the development of a strong private sector economy. And the government is also developing a program to enlist men into the army for four years, which it says will create a trained and disciplined labor force for the country. But that plan does nothing to address the lack of women in the country's workforce. India's labor problems could become far worse in the years to come. Today, India has a huge population of young people, but its birth rate is falling rapidly. In the next few decades, it's expected that India's population will start aging rapidly. If that happens before India develops a modern workforce, it could be disastrous. A relatively small, low-earning population of young people will be forced to support an increasingly large population of seniors. If that were to happen, any hope for India returning to its historic status as one of the world's wealthiest nations would be lost. The income and labor force needed for that to happen simply won't be there, and India will remain a low-income country. There is still time to turn things around, and today, India has an opportunity to do just that. As multinational firms shift production out of China due to tensions with the United States and the West, they are increasingly looking to India as an alternative. India could take advantage of this wave of foreign cash coming into the country to invest in education and implement reforms that would encourage young people and women to enter the workforce. It could reform its educational institutions and step back from its cronyism with large corporations, creating room for new startup companies to expand. But whether or not it takes these steps remains to be seen. In the meantime, we shouldn't hold our breath waiting for a modern and wealthy India to emerge. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for the latest news and analysis on the world of economics. Thanks for watching.